how to play the Queen's Gambit. Well, here's the latest in the series and let me show you how with a splendid game played by Boris Spassky. There we go, there's the Queen's Gambit on the board. Don't forget to like, comment, share and subscribe. Let's hit that 100K. And if you want to support us, then do so, please, via PayPal or Patreon. We'd be very grateful. So this is a game between Jan Timon and Boris Spassky, played in um, a match so they played in 1983. And uh, I'm very keen to look at another game by Boris Spassky uh, because he was such a great exponent of the, the black side of the Queen's Gambit. And, well, I did show you a game where he got smashed by Karpov. So, well, let's see what happens in this game. So bishop to g5 pinning and puts a little bit of pressure on the knight and therefore this pawn as well. Bishop blocks the pin and black castles. See, this is what I like about the Queen's Gambit declined as black. You don't mess around. You do all the simple things absolutely right. Get your pieces out, you get your king to safety and then you can think about strategy with a clear conscience and a, and a sound pawn structure as well. Pawn to h6, it's very useful to throw in this move because in the middle game it's nice to have an escape square for the king so you don't get caught out with back rank tricks. And we're very happy if white gives up bishop for knight in this position. So bishop comes back to h4 and now pawn to b6. Now I've mentioned this before, we've seen games with this before. The so-called Tartko variation where this bishop comes to this superb long diagonal and turns into a monster piece. Bishop here, bishop b2, bishop b7. Now, Timmons' next move might surprise you a little bit. He exchanged on f6. Well, hang on. He just declined to exchange a few moments ago. What's he doing? Ah, the position has changed. Because now the bishop is on b7, he exchanges these pieces. And can you see with this fixed pawn structure, that pawn on d5 is blocked solidly. Nice pawn chain. And if that pawn on d5 is blocked, then that bishop is blocked in as well. Be very different with the bishop here. In this position, if the bishop had exchanged here, that's completely different because... Well, that's a very sound structure with the pawns here, and that bishop can easily come out somewhere on this diagonal. So you see the difference. And this line was actually one of the most popular variations in to, to play for white in the 1980s and 1990s. I'll give you more on the theory at the end of the game, but let's, let's rattle on with this one. And Timon's strategy is very interesting. So he puts pressure on this pawn, I mean, obviously that can be defended easily. And then he plays rook to d1, very mysterious. The rook isn't on an open fire, but the point is this. He's basically discouraging black from breaking out with pawn to c5, because then white would exchange. Well, I mean, the pawn could be taken anyway, but this, this is in the future. He's basically making sure that there's going to be enough firepower on that pawn on d5 so that black can never attempt the c5 break, which would instantly make these pieces a lot better, a lot more active. But let's see how Spassky deals with that. First of all, rook e8. Good move. This is where the rook belongs in these kind of pawn structures on the semi-open file. Rook e1. Also slightly mysterious, but well, we'll see what's going on in a second. Knight here. Very common manoeuvre in this whole variation, this typical structure. The knight very often wants to land on this square. Pawn to e4. Whoops, sorry. Pawn to e4. Action replay. I'll do that again. Hang on a second. Pawn to e4. Let's play it cleanly. Right, so this is what Timon is up to. It wasn't just about preventing black from playing c5, but he's supporting his centre... He's got his rooks in the middle, and he's trying to blast through the middle. If that pawn is taken, let's just have a little look. Pawn takes pawn. Bishop here, hitting this pawn. That has to be covered. Knight here, and white has a really nice attacking position. 
And you can see how that bishop just isn't looking very good there, blocked in by this pawn. So let's go back. So how did Spassky deal with this pawn? Well, very calmly. He just put his knight on e6. Sound move. You can see this pressure here. Now, exchanging wouldn't do white any good at all. You can see black's pieces lined up perfectly looking at that pawn here. Whoops. Misfired again. There we go. Black is fine there. So Timon carries out his strategy of advancing the pawn to e5, pushes the bishop back. So he has got a kingside pawn majority here. If he can advance that pawn to f5 and push the knight out of the way, things will be good. But that's not so easy to, to actually get in. And this part of the game, well, there's lots of very close manoeuvring. It's not quite clear what either side wants, but actually, as we're going to discover, Spassky's manoeuvring was far more effective than Timmons. G3 covers the F4 square. Rook C8. Now, this is the start of a very nice manoeuvre. Watch what happens. So G6, very good. And pawn to h5, so potentially that bishop can shoot out to h6. You know, white's got to be on its guard. Rook c1 would be a mistake. That would skewer these two. So, nice move, h5. Bishop g2. Well, you notice there's still a lot of firepower. Lots of white pieces directed against c5, against d5. You know, he's trying to prevent this break c5. But watch what Spassky does. This is really beautiful. And I've I've always loved this game uh, precisely because of this manoeuvre. That's always one that struck me as, as just, well, yeah, just a little bit unusual and just marks out the game as something very special. So Spassky has brought his rook here from the corner. So you can see he's lining up his pieces, protecting that pawn on d5. And that means that he's getting ready to break with c5. And well, particularly with that knight on e6, looking at the pawn there, that could be very nice. Timmy plays b4, so he's trying to prevent that or sort of make it difficult anyway. In fact, c5 is... It's actually possible here, but I like the way Spassky plays now, very calmly. Queen e7. You can see he's lined up queen and bishop on this diagonal. Timon plays the rook back. Okay, not clear what he's doing, but then again, really wasn't... I, I think there's no easy strategy for white. Now, pawn to a5 from Spassky. I think this is so interesting, and I've seen Spassky play like this um, in, in another game. There was There's a wonderful game he played against Korchnoi from uh, their candidates match in 77, and this worked perfectly there. You know, there's a lot of nonsense talked about this so-called minority attack. Some people are really scared of it, but here Spassky shows how to attack these pawns and actually makes makes them quite weak. If these pawns are exchanged and, well, that pawn is hit, so let's say a4, you can see that square is available for black's pieces. And now bishop a6, you can see how Spassky has managed to carve out territory for his pieces. That bishop is potentially going to come here. Maybe the rooks will come across and hit here, and those pawns looking weak. That pawn on c6, well, how does white get to it? You can't. So a5, very nice move, the kind of move that's it's very easy to overlook when you know you one feels that white ought to have the initiative on this side of the board, but no, it's turned Spassky's way after this move. Knight a4 from Timon. Now things start to get a bit random. I can imagine that time pressure was approaching. So this little trade here after this transaction we've have had a few pawns exchanged and the queen comes back to e7 so who's benefited by those exchanges well black is still rock solid actually 
pieces still look good. That knight is slightly oddly placed on b6. It's not actually attacking anything. This knight looking good, attacking the pawn on d4. And there is potential here. That's what I like about black's position. There's potential to break with c5 as well. Well, Timon understood that, of course, and he lends some protection to the pawn on d4. And now, again, very calm from Spassky, rook d8. Just making sure this is protected so that pawn to c5 becomes an option. This is wonderfully played, so really sensitively played by Spassky. Now, white is still okay here. Actually, knight a4 will keep white in the game. Um, it looks a little bit awkward, you know, there's potentially a pin there, but actually it, it's it's all right for, for white. Um, I mean, this bishop can also come to a6 as well, but white is still all right. But Timon played rook b2. And this gives Spassky a chance. Pawn to c5, breaking out. And now pawn to d4, great move. So just liberating that bishop before recapturing here. And that pawn starts to look quite menacing. Whoops, that was unintentional. I hit the wrong button. Okay, I'm having problems today. Um, pawn takes pawn, d4, that's where we're at. Queen a3. Rook takes pawn. So pawns are even, material is even, but black has a really dangerous initiative, and it's to do with that knight. That knight is actually stranded, and, and black's piece is just looking so beautifully coordinated here. Um, I mean, already you can see that with the rook on c5, there's pressure on this pawn. There's potentially the idea just to, to exchange off bishop for knight and take that pawn. That's one option. But black can decide. Knight a4, and this hits uh, an unfortunate accident. There's an unfortunate accident now. Rook here, great move. Rook takes rook, allows queen takes queen. And if queen takes queen here, we throw in rook takes rook check, and then take the queen back. Queen d3 played to protect the rook. And now a queen swoops down. Queen a3, threatening white's queen, threatening the knight. White is lost. Queen f1, exchange of rooks. And that queen is looking at both these pieces. And there's a very simple move which tips white over the edge. Bishop here attacking the knight. Well, once the knight moves, then queen takes rook. So basically, black is just winning a piece in that position. What a game by Spassky. Brilliant strategic game. You know, that there are those subtle moves I pointed out. You know, I love this manoeuvre of rook c8 and then a few moves later rook c7 and rook d7 and then later on even here we had rook d8 going for c5 i mean really great maneuvers let me just show you a bit of theory here so as i said this line actually very popular in, in the 1980s and 1990s, uh, played, for example, in many games in the Karpov-Kasparov match in, in the 1980s. And here, instead of castles, b4 actually turned into the main line. And now there are two possibilities for black. One is to break out straight away with c5. And, well... Karpov and Kasparov proved that, well, what did they prove? They both, they proved that this is hard work and that they were very well prepared and that if black plays accurately, you can make a draw. So, for example, like this. And bishop b5, I mean, this is kind of the starting point of this variation. They played lots of games from this position. White is, tr with this exchange, white is trying to weaken that pawn on d5 
And if you know your stuff, I think black is fine, uh, as well the, the, the two Ks proved. Um, personally, I prefer to keep a bit more tension in the position and play the pawn to c6. And this has also been shown to be playable. And in this position, you can actually break out straight away with a5. That's a possibility. You can also play knight d7, and I rather like this. This is actually the line that I recommended on my, my DVD download, uh, my repertoire for black um, in the Queen's Gambit decline for chess base. And actually, you can play b5, which obviously stops white from playing b5 himself. And you basically want to sit that knight on c4. And, and it's a tense position. And eventually this bishop will reroute itself here. But there are other ways to play the position. Um, but yeah, basically b4 is the main line here. Hope you enjoyed that. More Queen's Gambit coming your way soon. Thanks for watching.